Okay, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you guys today. You guys are definitely going to want to come to Kids Stuff. Uh, it is so much fun. It's an incredible family experience. I personally won't be there. I'm terrified to come because as the pastor of the church, they want to make me do stuff. And they keep telling me, we're going to put you on stage and make you eat something weird or we're going to make you do a dance. And I'm just like, okay, okay, I'll just be sick every time there's kid stuff. So, no, but you guys are, are safe, to, safe to come. It's a, it's a fun time. It really is. Um, I just want to say thank you to Sonia and her daughter, you know, for coming up here and hosting. That's a really an amazing thing. And we actually, um, I had to remind myself this morning that this was, was my idea. As Trudy and I sat down and thought about how do we get the kids more engaged. Uh, it wasn't so much let's invite the parents to then invite their kids. It was let's go for the kids and then have the kids invite their parents. And so that's been really cool to see that play out. And we want to continue to do that. And that'll be fun. And uh, thank you for celebrating with us and, and my wife for, having a, for finally getting a visa. Um, it has been a long seven-year uh, trial for us. Uh, you know, Casey, if you know her, she's this sweet, innocent woman. And somehow through home affairs and corruption there, Casey ended up with a valid visa that was uh, illegal. And we found that out when we were in Swaziland trying to get back into South Africa. And we were turned away at the border and... And that was seven years ago, and it was like, wow, how the things that we've gone through uh, to get to this point, we were interrogated separately to make sure that we were really married. We had to go to the high court. I mean, it, it was. We had a lawyer get arrested, and they were burning the files, and I had to run in and grab our file and take it to another lawyer. I mean, it was absolutely crazy. It really was like a movie, but it, it's good to, to just see God bring closure to that, and it kind of accidentally lines up with what we're talking about today, where we're talking about this thing called perseverance today. And I, we didn't plan it that God would answer this prayer of Casey's visa in line with the sermon, but God just works that way, and he did. So today, perseverance. Last week, we started talking about suffering, and perseverance is very much linked to suffering. In fact, a, a little bit about me is a long time ago, years and years ago, I used to run. I used to run a ton. I did 100-mile races in, when we lived in the States. I did 50K. I did 80K. I did, uh, you know, 100K races. I loved the long-distance uh, trail running and trail racing. And that required an enormous amount of perseverance. And I can promise you that all the perseverance that was required in that was very much linked to suffering. And so I actually had a running coach who looked at me one day and he said, if I could take your brain and your ability to suffer and put it in an actual athlete's body, we would have something incredible. <laughs> That's true. He did say that. He did. He was a, a, a collegiate uh, cross-country coach, and I convinced him to train me just a regular guy and see what would happen because he wanted to see how this ultra running thing worked out. But, but anyway, so I, I at least prided myself, and I would tell people on the starting line, um, I, would, I would say, hey, you may be faster, but I can suffer better than you can, and just to try and, try and get in their head. And, and this whole thing of, of perseverance, I, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page, so I'm, I'm going to read a definition. This is what it means to persevere. It means to continue in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty, or with little or no indication of success. So I'll read that again. Continue in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty. So even when things look difficult. Or even when there is little or no indication of success. Now, I, I came around a very important truth that was associated with this definition. And it's that many of the relationships that are out there are due to this right here. Because there's a whole bunch of men in the room that had no chance at, at getting the girl that they're with now to date them. And yet, even in the face of difficulty, and even with no indication of success, you still continued to pursue and pursue and pursue. And finally, I guess you just wore her down, and she said, okay, fine, I'll go on a date with you. So we can thank a lot of relationships to perseverance, and we can also thank a lot of uh, you know, amazing things that have, uh, we've accomplished in mankind. You know, when I think of perseverance or to persevere, and I think you guys probably do the same thing, we go to the place of, of, of victory. So when you think about persevering, you think about what it's like to be on the other side of it where you've got the victory, where you've climbed the mountain, where you've finished the race, where you've conquered whatever it is that you've conquered. We often think that uh, of the end part. 
That's the part that, where, where you see the glory. That's the part that we want. I know online, if you go on YouTube, there's so many transition videos where people say, you know, I lost 100 pounds in a year, and they've got the before picture and the after picture. And it's like, well, I want to see that video because I want to see what it looks like after you've persevered and after you've gone through the diet and after you've worked out and, and done all of the, the body transformation things. But we're very much interested in the end result. And what, what I want to highlight today and talk about is that to persevere and perseverance, especially in relationship with, uh, with, with suffering, it's not about the end. See, if we could all do it because what we see at the end, then we would all have no problem persevering through suffering. And last week we talked about why is there suffering. Well, it's because there's sin in the world. The world is a broken place, and therefore we suffer. We suffer because people hurt us. Well, people hurt us because they're broken people, because they have sin. there's sin in the world. Their hearts are broken, and that impacts other people, and that's why they're suffering. But now that we know why they're suffering, what do we do in that suffering? And what do we do with that suffering? And see, there's a verse in the Bible that, that is kind of famous for this, and it gets quoted all the time, and, and people send it in WhatsApps to others, and it's on inspirational cards, and, and it's one of those go-to verses that people will show you when you're going through a hard time. And it's one of those go-to verses that maybe you go to when you're having a hard time, when you're suffering, when you feel like you're persevering, or you feel like something like the world is up against you. And you go to this verse and you read it and you kind of expect magic to happen. And, and I think, like I talked about last week, there's this book, this Bible. It's amazing. It comes with, with so much in it. That is there. It's God's living word. And everything in here is right and everything in here is good. But the problem is, is that when we take this and we flip to a verse or we flip to a page and we find something that makes us feel good about ourselves or, or feel good about our situation and we don't take the time to apply, you know, what context was it in? Is this really for me? Is this not for me? You know, so I want to make sure that we look at the scripture and we look at the scripture we're going to see today from the right perspective. So I'm going to read this, this scripture for you in full, and then we're going to kind of break it down a little bit. And so this starts in, in James, and it starts uh, as a letter from the guy named James. And James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes. So let me just pause real quick. The reason that this is in here and that I'm showing this to you and that it's significant is this is the same James that is the brother of Jesus. Now, the brother of Jesus did not believe that Jesus was the resurrected, or he didn't believe that Jesus was Lord. He didn't believe Jesus was, was the Son of God. He made fun of Jesus. And now you've got James, who's been for the last 30 years post the resurrection of Jesus, James has been leading the church. He's in charge leading the church that Jesus went out to establish. And it was because of the resurrection of Jesus that James changed. And so now you have someone that used to make fun of their brother for calling themselves the Son of God, who is now serving the church and willing to give his life for the church because of what his brother Jesus did, because he saw Jesus resurrect after, after he died, and he said, I will raise in three days, and Jesus did it. And James said, wow, this guy actually did it. Maybe this whole time he was right. I kind of shouldn't have picked on him so much. And so now James is leading the church. And so James is, is writing this letter. And in this letter, and this is one of my favorite books of the Bible, but here comes the part that we all turn to. Verse 2 here. It says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. Have we heard that? Yeah. Hey, life's hard? Consider it joy. Consider it pure joy when you face many trials. Oh, you're going through a trial. That must mean that there's some joy for you. Oh, Jesus is working in your life. Hey, I know today's hard, but count it joy because God is moving. God is working. This, this is what we tell ourselves. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. There's that word perseverance. It's like, okay. So we go on to the next verse, verse 4. Let perseverance, there it is again, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. And then verse 12, or ver verse 5 says this. Go to the next verse. Or verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. 
Because having stood the time, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So blessed is the one who perseveres. So here we've been talking about perseverance. And here's this scripture that's kind of famous because we all go to it. And, and, and it's our go-to verse when we have trials and suffering that's in our life. Consider it pure joy. Now, the, the line that, that we go to is this. Consider it pure joy when. Now, what I want to do, and I've tried to do this over the last, really since Easter, is I want to bring reality into the sermon. And so I think it's a lot for me to ask for me to just put that verse on the screen and tell you that you should consider it joy when you have trials in your life or you have suffering in your life. You should consider it joy when you need to persevere or you need to push through. Because I can tell you whether it's physical perseverance, even though I was good at physically persevering, I did not, none of it was joyful. There, there was never joy in those moments. There was always joy afterwards, but not in it. And I'm not going to ask you to take what the Bible says and just, hey, consider it joy. If you're going through a trial, consider it joy. Amen. Coffee's outside. We're ready to go. Everybody gets up and walks out, but nobody's really gotten it. So I want to make sure that if we choose this, I want to make sure if you choose this for your life, that you actually mean it and that you actually stand behind it and you know what it means for you. And so let's look again at verse 2. So before I go into this, this is your opportunity. If you find yourself frustrated with God because of your situation, which it's okay to be there. You know, we're talking about Casey and I waiting seven years for, for her visa situation to get sorted out. If you find yourself frustrated with God, this is the time to vent that frustration. I'm going to give you permission. I'm going to give you permission to question God. I'm going to give you permission to doubt God. I'm going to give you permission to call what God has said just complete hogwash. I'm going to give you permission to say that James was foolish and what he wrote does not apply to you. And we're, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. We're not going to finish there. But some of you need to accept it. Some of you need to accept that you're aggravated and that you're mad and that you don't understand how James or how the Bible could ask of you to, to manage your suffering and, and persevere through something that it doesn't know what's going on in your life. And so that's what we're going to do here. Verse 2, whenever you face trials of many kind, you know what face means in this context? The Greek for face means whenever you are taken by surprise. Trials of many kind, taken by surprise. So when you face a trial, it's not one that you saw coming. It's one that took you by surprise. What are the things that take you by surprise? Something that a friend said that you would think they never would have said. Something that a boss did that you would think they never would have done. Something that happened financially that you weren't prepared for or you weren't ready for. There's that, that person that breaks up with you and you think everything is great and our relationship is wonderful and all of a sudden they're gone and the relationship is over and you're like, wait a minute, I did not see that coming. You know, most of our hurt that we don't see coming comes from us, from each other. We, we hurt each other. We don't mean to, but it's what we do. And so right at front, James is saying, whenever you are taken by surprise in trials of many kind, now, if we go on to the next verse, or, or continuation of two, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. So whenever you face trials of many kind, of any kind, consider it pure joy. And what consider means, what the Greek of this means is adjust your perspective or thinking. So James is saying, when you face trials, adjust your thinking because it's pure joy, my brothers and sisters. See, all of a sudden, when we pick this verse apart, this becomes hard to accept. It becomes hard to apply to our lives. In fact, let me show you what I think that this verse is, is actually saying. And this is a paraphrase that, that we'll put on here for you. Reframe or rethink your trials in just a way that you can consider it pure joy. Reframe or rethink your trial in just a way that you can consider it pure joy. That, that's hard to do. You know, I don't know about you, but you could be sitting there saying, James, you want me to reframe or rethink my trial just so I can consider it pure joy? You, you want me to rethink that, that my child is sick and consider it pure joy that I have a sick child? 
You want me to, to reframe and rethink the hurt that happened in the relationship when my wife or my husband walked out on me? And you want me to consider it pure joy? James, you don't know me. James, you don't know what I've gone through. You don't know the hurt that I've felt. You don't know what it felt like. You know, I spoke with a man over the weekend, this amazing guy telling me about how his family was picked up from one part of Cape Town and moved to another. And many, you guys know what I'm talking about. And as, as he communicated the hurt and the pain to me, so I, can, I, can't, I can't identify with that, but I can be compassionate towards it. And I don't, I don't even want to try to identify with that. But you know what? There's, there's a bunch of people in Cape Town and in South Africa that would say, James, you want me to reframe or rethink my trial and consider it pure joy? That's not going to happen, buddy. I don't see that happening in my life. You know, I, when, when I was in the, the middle of some of my greatest depression, complete massive breakdown, I remember, I've, I've told this story before, but Casey and I were walking down Rondevosh Common, and I remember the tree that I was under, and as I'm walking under this tree, I looked at Casey, and I just said, it's easier to not believe in God than it is to believe in Him and accept the hurt that I feel from Him. It's easier for me to say, God, I choose not to believe in you, because if I choose to believe in you, then I have to accept that you want this for me? You want me to rethink my lowest moments. You want me to rethink the depression that I feel. You want me to rethink the hurt or the injustice that's happened to me and consider it pure joy? Can any of us identify with that? See, I'm hammering this because you're here. There's one of you, there's two of you, there's 30 of you that are in the audience here that, that I want to give you permission to think this. I want you to struggle through this. I want you to think about what it is in your life that you've been suffering with and what it is that you feel like you've got to try and persevere through. You know, your financial situation, having broken down cars, not knowing how to pay the bills next month, not knowing how to keep the business open, not knowing how to cope with the struggles that are in your family, not knowing how to cope with the struggles that are going on in your kids. You want the best for your kids, but you see them choosing different pathways. And then all of that, Someone sends you a verse from James and says, consider it pure joy when you go through trials. And I just think, hey, it's okay to pause and to say, Jesus, you want me to do what? Because your brother James, thousands of years ago, before he knew about social media and Twitter and Instagram, before he knew about sexting and cell phone cameras with, or cell phones with cameras on them, before he knew about the social pressures that we go through today, before he knew about what, what kind of things humanity would go to in order to hurt people, before he knew about our struggles, our unique struggles because of this day and this time and where we live and how we live, he says this, and then we just are supposed to follow that and consider it pure joy. And now look at what James says the reward is. If you do that, here's your reward. The next verse says, it produces. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Oh, that's amazing. So if I do those things, if I rethink the things that I rethink, and if I go down that road, then it's going to, produce uh, perseverance. Well, let's go back to the definition of perseverance. Perseverance is the ability. I think we'll put it on the screen for you. Perseverance is the ability to continue in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty, or with little or no indication of success. You know, to this, I would say, I don't want perseverance. In fact, I don't, I don't really want this at all. It would be a whole lot easier if, if I could just not grow. I mean, there were times when I prayed a prayer to God where I said, God, stop using me because I'm kind of tired of going through the trials and through the, the, the growth that you're bringing my family through. I, you know what? I, I think I'd like to just take a break. I'd like for you to stop using me. I don't know if, if anyone in here can identify with that. If the goal and the reward is that, is that we get more perseverance, do you, that it's like, hey, Here's a reward. If you do good, I'm going to let you get stung by another bee. It's like, you know, that, that, that's kind of what it could sound like to me. And then the verse goes on and it says, let perseverance finish. So let perseverance, this beautiful thing, this easy thing. Remember, perseverance is when you get good or is when you're facing things where there doesn't seem to be a hope. 
It's a trial that doesn't seem to be a way to win, and you're, you're pushing through, you're pushing through. So let that pushing through, despite there not being any hope, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. You know, if it were me, and it has been me, and I hope that it's been you, because we're real people. Can we be a real people in a real church? Can we just be honest? Can we be open? You know, we could do a whole lot better out there if we could be honest and open with ourselves in here. But, but there's a lot of us that need to, to own up to something that I owned up to a long time ago of, you know what, I don't want to be complete. I'm quite happy to lack everything. If you'll leave me alone, if I can go a month without the refrigerator breaking or without tires going flat, if we can go a, a month without a kid getting sick, if we can just go a month where everything is, is fine, where we don't get a phone call that rocks our world, if we can go a month where, where then I'd be, I'd be happy with, I, I'll, I'll lack. Don't complete anything in me. In fact, just leave me alone. See, you take a verse that we apply to our lives and we just say, hey, consider it joy. But I need us to be real. I need you to be real with yourself and I need you to be able to be real with your neighbor and with your community. And I need you to be okay when somebody out there is real with you and says this kind of stuff to you. And so now what we're going to do, the, the purpose of this sermon is not to convince you that Jesus is bad. But we have to, we have to accept it. And we have to accept that, that some of us feel this way. And before we can move forward, we have to be okay with where we are here. And so now let's, let's start over. We're going to start over and we're going to look at this verse again. Because there's something in here that I believe that you can be inspired to choose. No matter how hard your perseverance is, no matter what you're suffering through, or what you're going through, this is something that I don't want you to miss out on. And I've walked this road. I'm not asking you to do something blindly. I've been there. I go back to there. We've all been there. We've all done this. And so we're going to look at this verse again, and we're going to highlight some different things. So again, we go, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let me give you a little background. James wrote this. He didn't write this to the non-Christian. So if you don't know Jesus, if, if Jesus is not somebody that you've given your life over to, if you're visiting the church, then you know what? This, this isn't for you, but I hope that it can inspire you. And I hope that it can let you know about the Jesus that we love and that we serve. And maybe I hope that you can think, like, man, I can identify with these people because they're just being real about this stuff. And so there's something that, that James is getting at when he talks about the testing of your faith produces perseverance. James is writing to the Christian church. So James is writing to those that have already taken the, the step and prescribed to Jesus. They've already said, I'm a part of Jesus. I'm a part of this thing called the way. I'm a part of this church. And James is saying, hey, consider it joy because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So what happens with, with testing? Testing proves the authenticity of something. Testing proves the authenticity of something. See, when something gets tested, you get to learn how authentic it is. So when you test a diamond, and Josh, you can pop the next slide up on the screen. When you test a diamond, you learn how authentic that diamond is. And when you test it, you learn how authentic maybe it isn't. You know, I have friends that ordered a diamond, like an engagement ring online. That seems kind of risky. And then when they get it and they get it tested, they realize like, oh, actually, this thing is not a real diamond. You know, if I want to test the authenticity of my, of my physical fitness, then I would go run a race or I would go do some kind of sporting activity. But testing is important here because it, it, it proves the authenticity of something. So James is choosing this word, testing your faith, because testing and trials... What they do is they expose the authenticity of our faith. See, when we're tested, when we go through these trials, it shows us how authentic our faith actually is. Trials expose the authenticity of our confidence in God. Now, there's a spectrum here. 
and you can find yourself anywhere on there. If you, if you filter yourself through this, if you say, okay, if trials expose the authenticity of my faith, then that means that my faith is very, very, very inauthentic. I want you to know that that's okay. If, if trials and testing expose how, how authentic your confidence in God is, and you have amazing confidence, fantastic, but maybe it exposes that you have literally zero confidence in God. You have nothing because you're going through these trials, your faith is being tested, and instead of counting it pure joy, you're saying, I'm not even confident in God at all. I want you to know that that's okay. See, James is, is writing this to say that, that this right here is, is to show you kind of the measure of your faith. And we know that based on the way that things are tested because you test things to know how authentic it is. It's like taking a test in school. And we want to know how authentic your knowledge is or your ability to memorize or your ability to cheat. But either way, when you get tested, you're going to find out how good you are at that thing, whichever it is. I was amazing at just cruising, just barely doing enough that I needed to do to get by. And every test I took, I proved that. I could just, just do enough to not get in trouble, but not fail, you know, right in that middle, in that middle line. And so there's, there's this tension in your life. And in the center of that tension is, is actually where you find God's activity in your life. So the, the tension in your life is at the center of God's activity in your life. So what is that thing that you're praying for? What is that thing that you're suffering through? What is that thing that you're having to persevere through? Well, whatever that thing is, that's the tension in your life and God is at the center of it. And so this testing that we go through is important because it lets us know who we are and what we're made of. And now I'm going to read forward in verse 4. There's so much that I could say to this, but I've got to move on. Verse 4, just going to read this again. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. You know, what does it mean to be complete? What, what does it mean for us to feel complete? How, how much time do we spend feeling incomplete or inadequate? How much of our suffering makes us feel inadequate? Or makes us feel incomplete? How much of, of the trials that we go through make us feel inadequate or make us feel incomplete? I know that even if you don't prescribe to this Jesus thing and this God thing, I know that there's a desire in you to feel complete. And what James is doing here, for those that prescribe to it, for those that choose it, and we're going to get to that choice at the end, but for those that choose it, James is saying that this perseverance, this thing that isn't that easy, but this thing that you can consider joy, and the reason you can consider it joyful is because it will complete you. Because it will make you whole. It will complete the work that God is doing in you. Now, that, that's something that I've felt in my life. And that's something that, that when I felt that, that sort of that ongoing completion of Jesus working in my life, you know, I look back on all those days that I suffered and all those days that I thought God stopped using me. I don't want any part of this. I look back on those and I think, man, that was such a purposeful time in my life because it shaped me and it made me who I am. And yes, I doubted God through it. And yes, I didn't understand why James would write the things that he wrote. But I still continued to just barely choose God. And as I barely chose God, God built our faith and he built the faith of our family. And then you get to a place where you just look back and you see the completion of it. You see the completion of, of, of your faith and, and that work that God wants to do in you. And see, God is so for you that he even gives you a way to ask for this. So if you want this, but you don't know how to get it, in verse 5, James tells us this. He says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So you, you, we can ask God for this wisdom. We can ask him. We say, Lord, give me the wisdom to know how to handle this situation or how to handle this, and God will give that to you. And then he goes on in verse 12 because I skip forward to find where he talks about persevering again. In verse 12, God says, Blessed is the one who, who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love them. See, 
God wants to give us something greater than we can ever have on earth. And that's this crown of life. This isn't a jewel-encrusted crown that we wear on our head. This is something that, that comes to us. This crown of life, some people could say that it's, it's you know, receiving what you receive in heaven. Some people could say it's a love of God. Or maybe the crown of life is peace. Maybe it's this peace that God gives you and that God fills your heart with and that he, and that he lets you have that. So he's telling you to persevere. He's telling you if you don't know how to persevere, that you can ask him and he'll show you how to do it. And then he's saying that if you persevere, he has this crown of life that he wants to give you. And so now let's, let's go back to verse 4. And then I'm going to ask you guys a question. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking in anything. So here's the truth. This is the last, last thing I'll say. This is the, the brutal truth that we have to look at is that no matter what you choose, you are going to be made complete in some way. So you can have a, a life of completion that is you just choosing to run away from everything bad. You know, you can sit there like we talked about at the beginning where you can sit there and say, God doesn't understand my situation. He doesn't understand my trials. You mean to tell me that you, James, want me to consider it joy that this thing is happening in my life, that my child is sick or that we're dealing with oppression or whatever it is. And if you decide to stay on that path and stay on that journey, guess what? You are going to be made complete in that. But you're going to be completely miserable. You're going to be completely empty. You're going to be completely angry and bitter. You're going to be completely seeking something better or something more. What's going to be made complete in you is the desire that never gets quenched to know that there's something more out there that loves you and that cares about you. Listen, I care so much about you. That's why I want to be real and I want to be honest about this stuff. But I don't want to see you walk out of this room having ended with, God, I don't understand why you would have me go through this. I can't tell you why God would have you go through this. But what I can tell you is that God's will for your life is that you choose Him. And that when you choose Him, He wants to complete a work in you spiritually. And that work that He wants to complete in you is one that brings you peace and that brings you comfort and brings you love. So think about your hard situation. Think about what you've suffered through. Wherever you are, whoever you are, think about what that is that you're praying that I wish God would take it away. And instead, I want you to turn it around and I want you to say, Lord, you, you are going to keep it there, fine. But, Father, I want to let go, and I want to just let you complete the work that you're trying to do in me. So the, the question to you is, what kind of complete do you want to become? See, this is your choice. You can be complete and bitter, or you can be complete and surrendered. Now, I've been both and been in both places. And in order to be complete and surrendered to God and accept what He has for me, I've had to work through the complete and the bitter. And so can I just ask in this room and for anyone watching online or anyone that comes across this message that, that you would let yourself work through the hurt, the pain, the bitterness. Let yourself work through that and instead hold on to this truth that yes, persevering is hard and yes, it may not, you may not have an end in sight where you see God doing something or you see relief coming to it. I mean, for seven years, Casey and I, we prayed and for seven years we had lawyers and advocates tell us this is nearly impossible to get Casey's visa cleared up and to get a legal visa and people would tell us, go home, quit. And then for three years, we tried to plant a church in Cape Town, and it just never happened. And, and we, we dealt with just rejection over and over and over again. And I had, I had local pastors actually tell me, maybe you should just go home because it's just not meant to be. Don't you think if it was meant to be that God would have kind of done it? Don't you think that if it was meant to be, the suffering would be over? Don't you think if it was meant to be, that thing that you're hoping would actually become and it would be? Don't you think if it was meant to be that the relationship would be easier or the parenting would be easier? If it was meant to be, it would work, right? But that's not the way God's economy works. That's not the way God works. So I don't want you to miss what God wants to complete in you. And Casey and I, we got to walk through this recently where we said, wow, a seven-year chapter is closed. 
And I've spent every morning and every night in front of my journal and my Bible just thanking God for the work that he completed in us. And so I'm going to leave you guys with a prayer. And I'm going to have the band come out. They're going to lead us in a song. And I want you in this time, I want you to really lean into this prayer and lean into this moment. Because when you go out there, life gets crazy. Things start to happen. Um, you know, you have to get the kids. Your kids are running around. We've got kids that are in charge of Wombland and Upstreet and Transit. Who knows what's happening out there? In fact, we may want to stay in here. You may not want to go out there at all. But the point is, is when you go out there, life starts and life happens. So let's pause and let's take on this moment here. I hope that we were able to get real and raw and it gave you permission to start to work through some real emotions and real feelings that you have. But I also hope that you don't forget that Jesus wants to complete a work in you that brings you peace and that brings you maturity and that, that, that brings you hope. And so the prayer that I would ask you to pray is whatever it is that's, that you're hoping to find completion through, whatever it is you're struggling through or you're having to persevere through, I want you to pray the prayer of Heavenly Father, use this until you decide to remove it. Use this, whatever it is, until you decide to remove it. And so I'll pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that...